Hi, my name is Raina McKay, I'm an, and I'm a GU medical oncologist at the University of California in San Diego. It's my pleasure to talk to you today about patient selection and metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. Here are my disclosures. As we all know, ADT has been the backbone of systemic therapy for patients with metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, dating back into work done by Huggins and Hodges in the 1940s. Over 80 years later, ADT still remains the mainstay of therapy, but the treatments have really evolved for the different disease states of patients with prostate cancer. We're gonna focus on talking about treatment options for patients with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. And as you can see, the treatment options have expanded recently. A key to developing anti-cancer combination treatments is really focused on three key basic oncologic pillars. That includes drugs with distinct mechanisms of actions, drugs that have demonstrated single agent activity, and drugs that lack overlapping toxicity. And I think this is really what led to the expansion of options for patients with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. The treatment landscape for metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer really shifted in 2015 with the reporting of data from Chartered and Stampede, which demonstrated that the addition of docetaxel to the backbone of ADT improved overall survival for patients with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. As we can see, a series of subsequent studies, including Latitude and Stampede, which demonstrated the benefit of abiraterone, Titan, which demonstrated the benefit of apalutamide, Arches and Enzymet, which demonstrated the benefit of enzalutamide, have all moved into the treatment landscape for patients with metastatic hormone-sensitive disease. Additionally, in 2022, we saw data for triple therapy from um, the PEACE-1 trial, which looked at abiraterone and docetaxel, and also Aerosense, which looked at darolutamide plus docetaxel. Additionally, from Stampede, we saw the benefit of primary directed radiation therapy for those patients presenting with low volume de novo metastatic disease. Here we can see the NCCN guidelines for management of patients with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. And you can see that ADT plus X or an NHT is the backbone of therapy. For patients that are receiving docetaxel, it is recommended that they also receive either abiraterone or darolutamide and radiation to the primary is uh, can be indicated for those patients with low volume M1 disease. It is a very rare scenario for patients to receive single agent ADT um, when they have metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. Now there are many factors that impact treatment decision for selecting any given therapy for a given patient. There can be disease factors, including volume of disease or risk of disease, whether the disease was recurrent or de novo, sites of METs, Gleason score, and genomic features. Additionally, there can be clinical factors such as the presence of symptoms, performance status, comorbidities, concurrent medications that may potentially have drug-drug interactions with other drugs, and also drug factors, including the mechanism of action of the select agent, the mode of administration, and cost. So we're going to delve into each of these factors and discuss how to better optimize patient selection for patients with metastatic hormone-sensitive disease. We'll first delve into uh, disease factors. One of the most prevalent parameters to help us with uh, stratification for therapy has been patients with high and low volume disease. High volume disease was really defined according to the charted study and is really representative of patients who have four mole bone metastases with at least one outside of the pelvis or the vertebral column and or the presence of visceral metastases. Now high risk disease was utilized in the latitude study. And latitude uses a slightly different criteria. Um, and it's patients that have two or more of the following features of either three or more bone metastases, visceral metastases, or a Gleason score of eight or greater. Several studies have actually demonstrated that there's, there's great concordance between this charted and latitude definitions of low volume, low risk, and high volume, high risk disease with concordance around 80% or higher. And this is data from Stampede that actually applied the charted and latitude definitions and demonstrated that there was actually concordance. You can see here the Kaplan-Meier curves for overall survival 
for low volume patients from um, Stampede using the charted definition, also overall survival for high volume patients using the charted definition. And similarly, they applied the latitude definition for low and high risk disease. And you can see that there is a concordance and similarities with, with in the Kappa-Meyer curves um, from Stampede when these definitions were applied. Now let's talk about doublet treatments for high volume disease. So what I mean by doublet treatments is ADT plus X and whether that X is docetaxel from the early docetaxel studies or an ARSI from Latitude, Stampede, Arches, Enzymat, Titan. And you can see that across the board adding either docetaxel or um, an androgen receptor signaling inhibitor improves outcomes for patients with high volume disease. You can see for radiotherapy that there really is not a benefit to primary directed therapy for those patients that have high volume disease. Now let's talk about low risk patients. For low risk patients or low volume patients, there's a clear and distinct benefit for use of an ARSI in addition to ADT as demonstrated by the hazard ratios here. The data for docetaxel in the context of low volume disease is a little bit mixed. As you can see, Stampede and the JUTAG trial did not demonstrate a benefit for the low volume patients, though this was seen in Stampede C. With regards to radiotherapy to the primary for those patients presenting with de novo metastatic disease, we do see a benefit from Stampede H and even the HARAD trial of um, uh, uh, improved uh, uh, survival with radiation to the primary um, for those patients that have low volume disease. So now we spent a little bit of time talking about ADT plus X and specifically talking about the early data of ADT plus docetaxel. Um, well, here I wanna highlight strategies that are kind of uh, moving us into the next phase of treatment of uh, triple therapies. And in 2022, we see the reporting out of piece one, which looked at the combination of ADT plus docetaxel plus abiraterone, and also Aerosens, which looked at ADT plus docetaxel plus darolutamide. And here are the schemas for each of these studies. Both of these trials were positive trials demonstrating that the addition of an ARSI improved overall survival for patients with uh, metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer compared to ADT plus docetaxel alone. Um, with regards to the PEACE-1 data, we do see a breakout by um, high and low volume disease, and that benefit really seems to be driven by those patients that have high volume disease when we're adding docetaxel. The Aronsense data that's been presented to date is really for the overall population, and we see a clear benefit of the addition of darolutamide to the backbone of ADT plus docetaxel. Um, as of yet, we have not seen uh, data broken down by a, a high volume and low volume disease, though this will be presented at the upcoming GU ASCO meeting uh, by Dr. Hussein um, uh, this uh, coming February. So really eager to see uh, that data. But I think what these uh, data drive home is that actually when using docetaxel, it is no longer standard of care to just use ADT and docetaxel, that the new standard of care is ADT plus docetaxel plus either abiraterone or um, darolutamide, given these two studies demonstrated improvements in overall survival with the addition of these agents. Another factor that's critically important is timing of metastases. And we've seen data um, presented from Charted demonstrating that the uh, timing of uh, metastasis development is actually critically important. For those patients developing synchronous met metastatic disease compared to metacritus metastatic disease, they seem to have differential outcomes. Um, patients who present with de novo metastatic disease seem to have worse outcomes compared to those who present with recurrent um, or uh, metachronous disease. And when we overlay that with um, high and uh, high volume and low volume status, we actually can begin to kind of develop a grid that, um, you know, the de novo high volume patients seem to have the worst prognosis um, followed uh, by the low volume de novo or high volume recurrent. And patients who have the uh, most favorable prognosis are those patients that have recurrent disease that's low volume. And this is kind of played out here in these Kaplan-Meier curves um, that was uh, presented from the, the charted data. Other um, important factors that have been, uh, uh, you know, uh, important in thinking about uh, prognosis and, and factors that help guide therapy selection have been genomic alterations. Uh, we are now largely genomically profiling patients who have metastatic 
hormone sensitive disease and castration resistant disease and, and really doing this to help inform prognosis, uh, um, help uh, identify uh, predictive biomarkers for response to PARP inhibitors and immunotherapy, um, and also germline testing to help inform uh, cascade testing for family. Nonetheless, we've uh, multiple studies have demonstrated that actually um, the presence of uh, TP53, P10, RB1 are associated with um, uh, worse uh, prognosis um, uh, in data sets from uh, um, uh, charted. Additionally, SPOP has demonstrated uh, to be a prognostic of improved outcomes to hormonal therapies and ARSI. And additionally, there's data to suggest that patients with homologous recombination repair gene alterations seem to have um, inferior outcomes um, and uh, a shorter time to castration resistance um, in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting. And so genomic alterations are um, further being evaluated um, as being potentially uh, uh, factors that can inform treatment decision-making for patients with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. Additionally, there's been studies that have looked at transcriptomic signatures. Um, the charted trial looked at um, several transcriptomic signatures, including um, luminal B um, and basal signatures from the um, PAM50 data set, demonstrating that um, the luminal B seemed to be predictive of response to docetaxel, as you can see here. Additionally, the decipher uh, scores uh, were evaluated in the context of patients who um, received ADT and docetaxel, and, and you can see that for uh, the high-risk decipher score, uh, there did seem to be a benefit to the addition of docetaxel. And so I think uh, these data are going to evolve in the future um, regarding how we can apply the genomic and tra transcriptomic signatures into patient selection. And lastly, this is uh, um, data highlighting genomic alterations in high and low volume disease um, in patients with de novo prostate cancer. And you can see that there are differences um, across the spectrum of alterations that are seen in patients who have high volume disease. There seems to be um, more dysregulation of uh, the DNA repair genes, the cell cycle genes, Wnt signaling, and so forth when we compare to low volume disease patients. All right, shifting gears now, we're gonna talk about um, you know, the clinical factors that help impact uh, clinical decision-making for patients with metastatic hormone sensitive disease. I think when I think about clinical factors, I really like to break it down by uh, the type of therapy that could potentially be administered. And um, I think about abiraterone and the different side effects that can um, happen uh, when somebody is uh, receiving abiraterone. Um, you know, the, this medication is a sub-17 inhibitor that can cause mineralocorticoid excess and requires concurrent prednisone Use, so I think this is important when thinking about comorbidities for any given patient. Additionally, it does require frequent monitoring of liver function tests and also potassium levels, as that can happen in the context of this agent. When thinking about docetaxel treatment, of course, I think about performance status, um, what's, what's the uh, patient's baseline fatigue level, as this is um, sort of uh, one of the side effects of this medication. Additionally, docetaxel can cause edema, peripheral neuropathy, cytopenias, and hair loss, and I think um, this is uh, worthy of consideration when, when thinking about deciding this agent versus um, other uh, parameters. With regards to the AR antagonists, um, the major side effects are fatigue, falls, rash, hypothyroidism, and there can be drug-drug interactions that we need to be mindful of. And I do want to highlight briefly the data for GnRH antagonists. Um, there are considerations when these agents, as opposed to GnRH agonists, um, are utilized, given that these agents are not associated with an initial testosterone surge. So those patients presenting with obstructive urinary symptoms, cord compression, um, and there's been some data to suggest that um, these agents are associated with a low, with a more favorable cardiovascular profile. And so uh, there can be consideration for GnRH antagonists as well. Um, so, um, you know, uh, piggybacking on that, you know, I will present here the data from the HERO trial. Uh, HERO uh, evaluated um, the oral GnRH antagonist Relagolix compared to Luprolide with a primary endpoint of looking at um, sustained castration at 48 weeks and key secondary endpoints. And you can see that um, uh, Relagolix was actually um, uh, quite a uh, you know, uh, actually achieved the primary endpoint of sustained castration at 48 weeks. And additionally, it actually resulted in a more uh, rapid um, a time to uh, testosterone recovery following discontinuation of Relagolix. And in a post hoc exploratory analysis, it seemed to be associated with a lower risk of major um, cardiovascular events, particularly in patients with a history of a prior event. So I think this could be um, an agent that can be uh, considered in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting.
And lastly, what I'll highlight is drug factors, so mechanism of action, mode of administration, and cost. And again, looking at all the different agents that are approved in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting, um, you know, I think the key uh, differentiating factor about those ataxols, it's given IV, um, it's a low cost agent, six cycles, and then patients are done with therapy. Um, and then when we look at the, um, the oral agents um, or the hormonal agents, they are all oral. They're all given until disease progression, and they are associated um, with a higher cost. And so these, I think, are factors to consider when selecting a therapy for any given patient. Finally, clinical trials on the horizon. There's many trials uh, that are currently ongoing. Arano is looking at the addition of darolutamide to ADT um, compared to placebo and ADT. Um, Keynote 991 is looking at pembrolizumab plus enzalutamide. The Capitello trial is looking at um, uh, capivacertib in patients who have P10 loss by IHC. PSMA addition is looking at uh, lutetium um, PSMA. Amplitude and Talapro3 are looking at PARP inhibitors. Um, in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting in a selected patient population. So these are gonna be additional trials that will certainly inform the treatment of patients with metastatic hormone sensitive disease and will further complicate uh, selection strategies in the hormone sensitive setting. So in conclusion, ADT plus an ARSI with or without docetaxel is the standard of care for patients with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. Radiation to the primary can be considered in patients with de novo low volume disease and disease clinical and drug factors should all be considered when selecting therapy for any given patient. Thank you.